Okay, I want to begin with this. There is a tremendous spiritual potency in the Lord's Supper. How many would agree with that? There is just something about eating the supper that just brings us to a, a revival of our spirits. And um, it, it isn't anything new. As a matter of fact, I, I want to just share it with you a, a true story. Uh, Thomas Campbell was uh, in America. He left his family uh, in Ireland and came to America with the intention that they would be coming later. They did try to leave. The ship wrecked. The family ended up going back. Uh, and uh, his, his son, uh, who is uh, Alexander, ended up going to Glasgow to university in Scotland. But while Thomas is in America, he is, he is learning enough scripture that he is stepping away from his Presbyterian ministry understandings. So he, he's no longer adhering to everything that he's been taught. What is amazing is that while he's doing that, his son Alexander in Scotland is doing the same thing. And one of the things that motivated his stepping aside from Presbyterian teaching had specifically to do with the Lord's Supper. You see, at this particular time, before the, congregate, the Presbyterian congregations would partake of communion, and they weren't doing it every week, before they did it, you would get a visit from the church leaders. And they, they would give you a litany of questions. They would drill you. And if they thought you were worthy to take the Lord's Supper, they gave you a coin, a token. And then at the particular service that the supper was being offered, you would come and take your place literally at a table and you would, you, they would pass a plate and you would have to put your coin in to prove that you were a fit person to take uh, the Lord's Supper. Based solely on the response of that interrogation, they would decide who would get communion, they'd give you that token. And Alexander just became so troubled by that because there was no biblical support for it. He recognized anything that said anything about deciding who was worthy to take the Lord's Supper. So we can say that this principle, as well as others, helped lead Alexander to become one of the champions of what has been called the Restoration Movement, which is let's go back to just the Bible. And some of his statements just uh, illustrate his heart. Uh, he sought desperately to get back to, quote, simple evangelical Christianity. That's what he wanted to restore. And here's what he said about that. He taught that the Bible could bring unity to Christians and that only in unity could Christians effectively evangelize. Sounds very, very biblical. He said the union of Christians with the apostles' testimony is all sufficient and alone sufficient to convert to the conversion of the world. So in other words, the Bible is all we need to unite and that kind of unity, that kind of oneness is all we need to convert the world which is basically the same thing Jesus said. By your love for one another, they will know that you are my disciples. So we could say in a, a strange way that the Lord's Supper played a key role in the entire restoration movement. That the realization that, that we needed to have a, a, a spiritual experience based on biblical truth was centered as well on the Lord's Supper. It is only the Bible that serves as our rule of faith and practice. So we need nothing but the Bible and nothing more than the Bible. Hmm. We've been talking about how the, the supper is indeed a, a powerful spiritual influence. But uniquely we find in scripture that the Lord's Supper has the ability to be harmful as well as to be helpful. And what I would like to begin with uh, thinking about this morning is how the Lord's Supper can work us harm. How we can be harmed by this memory meal. We'll begin in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I do not praise you because you come together not for the better but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you and in part, I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, so that those who are 
approved may become evident among you. Therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry, and another is drunk. How the Lord's Supper can work harm. Number one, when the Lord's Supper becomes that which accentuates division, it can work harm. That was what was going on in the city of Corinth. The Lord's Supper actually became the catalyst around which the division that existed there was obvious. And so it is today, as, as we have the Lord's Supper, it has the potential of bringing to our minds and to our hearts divisive things and working us great harm. Paul clearly identifies that because of this division, he specifically says it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. So although they were eating the right emblems, they were doing it apparently at the right time, it was part of their service, uh, it was not the Lord's Supper that they were consuming because of their division. Literally, when it talks about division, it is the Greek word schisma, which means a gap or a standing apart. So he's saying what's happening as you eat the Lord's Supper is you're standing apart. You are, there's gaps between you. And those gaps had not ought to be. He says, but it makes sense that there are gaps because he says there's also factions. And factions is the Greek word heresis, and it just means choices. So what he is actually saying is that some at Corinth were making the choice to love their choices more than they loved other Christians. In other words, what they were choosing as their own preferences was more dear to them than the soul of a brother or a sister in Christ. And he says, that, that means you're not eating the Lord's Supper. You're not taking this meal for its intended purposes. It means that animosities and arrogance and agendas were advanced above community. That those were, those were held in individual lives as more significant than the fact that we're a part of God's saved family. It means that in their love feasts, and more than likely, I put probable, it's very probable that the wealthy were separating themselves from the people in need. They were going ahead and eating first. They, they had the means to do that. That was pretty much cultural at that time. The wealthy were treated with greater respect. Those that lacked funds were treated with less respect. Remember what James says about paying special attention. That was very cultural at the time. So in all probability, we've got a group of wealthy Christians who are doing the Lord's Supper in their own little cliquish way, while others are not even allowed to have it. And Paul says, that's, that's not the Lord's Supper. That's not what it's intended to be. It means they were meeting together, but they were really not one. They sat in the same place, in the same gathering. They all came together, but they, there, there wasn't this unity that was existing between them. Wednesday night, uh, we exposed, I think, a very interesting uh, uh, part of our study as we looked at some of the realities of Scripture. You know, <clears throat> we talked about the fact that in the Old Testament, God shows his power multiple occasions in multiple ways. But oftentimes, when God shows his power in the Old Testament, even when it was to an individual, it was really for the benefit of the nation or of Israel as a whole. So God would show his power for the benefit of his people as a whole. When we get to the New Testament, that gets reversed. That gets reversed. The old law was written on stone. The new law was going to be written where? On the heart. Whose? Yours. This new law is yours. This new covenant is yours. And again, as we go to, as we go to Scripture, we find multiple occasions when this, this is shown. This new covenant was now going to focus on the individual. The heart of an individual will be changed by the blood of Christ. No longer written on stone, but on hearts. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3, it says, Writing not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of the human heart. This new covenant is going to be, on, it's going to be mine. Not just ours. It's going to be mine. And that's going to be where it starts. And that's so much different than the, the way the law worked. So this new covenant is saying, 
I'm the one who believes. I'm the one who repents. I'm the one who confesses. I'm the one who dies to myself in baptism and is raised to walk in my newness of life. That's individual. But that individual walk gives me the gift of the, of the Spirit. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. It means that Christ is in me. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. Unless, he says, you fail the test. So if we try ourselves and we find that we're in Christ, then Christ is in us. 1 John chapter 14, Jesus said, My Father will love him and we will come and make our home in him. So deity is within us as individuals. We could uh, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16 where it says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God? The you in that passage is singular. He's not talking about the church. He's talking about us as Christians. I am God's temple. You are God's temple. And the word that is used there is not just, I think some translations say sanctuary. It actually is naos. It's the holy place. We are the holy place. That's where God dwells. And that, be, that begins in us as individuals. 1 Peter chapter 2 says like new, newborn babes, uh, we as individuals take on nourishment to grow because we are the ones who are saved. We are the ones who are taking on this milk so that we can grow. But what's really interesting about this new covenant is that although it is, it is beginning in individuals, those individuals are added to a community, not by anybody, but the Lord. So the Lord takes those who individually are his and puts them in a community. And we know it as the church, the ecclesia, the called out. So he saves us individually, but he puts us in community. Hmm. Why? What's the benefit? Can I, be, uh, can I have a relationship with Christ on my own? Yeah, but that's how, that's how it begins. But what does Jesus do when you do that? He places you in community. Deity in individuals results in a collective, unified powerhouse of God's new priests and nations, is what Peter calls us. We are a royal priesthood. We're a holy nation. We've been selected by God. So we're individuals who have accepted this, but we're put in a community of likewise people who have accepted. So all of that means is that this divisive attitude in the Lord's Supper, it, it, is, it is completely a spiritual oxymoron. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. If when I'm eating the supper, I'm contemplating how I disagree with somebody, how I hold a different opinion from somebody, and I'm putting a gap between them and myself, then... I'm not doing the Lord's Supper. Because God's plan was I save individuals and then I put them in a unified community. A unified community. Ephesians puts it, puts it this way. So then you're no longer stranger and aliens, but you are fellow citizens. We're not just a fellow citizen. We are fellow citizens with the saints. And you are God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. The whole building, the individually saved people are part of this community and there are people in this community who are helping us grow into a body of people that is more powerful in the Lord. In whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the spirit collectively as a people. We go to chapter 4. He gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God to the mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we're no longer children who are tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by the craftiness uh, in, evil, in deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, individuals, community, every joint supplies according to the power of working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building of the, up of itself in love. You know what I, I decided? The main reason God made it, put it, puts us in community, 
at least as far as what I can find in Scripture. The main reason, you know why when I as an individual take the saving blood of Jesus and I, I let God start living in me and then God puts me in a family, you know why? So I can grow up. So I can grow up. What spiritual characteristic can you grow in by yourself? Yeah, you can say, well, I can study more. Yeah. Anybody grow in patience all by yourself? No, you got to have community to grow in patience. Sorry. And I, I'm doing all I can to help you. You know, I'm just trying to help you be patient. Uh, forgiveness. Do you need to learn forgiveness if you're, you're, you're just living with you and Jesus? No, you enjoy forgiveness. Where do you learn forgiveness? In community. So why does God take someone who has been saved by his blood in whom God is dwelling and throw them into community? So they can grow up. I mean, that, that's just the simplest answer. So we can grow. We cannot grow otherwise. You know, stream services are, are a marvel of technology. Obviously, I love technology. It means I don't have to use a flannel graph anymore. So, you know, technology is great. And being able to have, being able to, to stream services is marvelous when, when people are providentially hindered from coming. But it's not made just so people can be lazy. That's not what it's for. You know, I hear, I, I read articles of churches all over the country who, since they've started live streaming, people don't come. And I've had people ask me, so have you guys, have you guys suffered some loss during this COVID time and live streaming? And I said, boy, I tell you what, everybody's pretty much over that. And, and thank God that we are a body where people recognize how important it is to be community. So, uh, growth. Nowhere else can you get stimulated to love and good works than in the assembly of God. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24 says that as we see this day approaching, we're stimulating each other to love and good works, to come together. Did you ever stop to think about what Thomas missed because he wasn't there? For a week he lived with doubt. For a week he did not believe Jesus was raised from the dead. Can you imagine that week? Can you imagine, can you imagine working with the others when they're all just bubbling over with excitement about what's going on and you're saying, I just don't believe that. You guys are just a little bit loony. Yeah, I think Thomas would have had a hard time taking the Lord's Supper with those guys, don't you? Because there would have been a division. There would have been a, a difference. There would have been a gap between where they were. The Lord's Supper also works harm when it demonstrates that one despises the church of God. That, actually, this whole sermon came from our reading the first part of the week. We were reading in our schedule of 1 Corinthians 11. And I'm just writing down to the marks in my Bible. Division. Despised. I'm writing down all these D words. How do you despise how do you despise the church of God? That's what Corinth was doing. Think about the nature of that accusation. Can you imagine Paul writing to Christians and saying, you guys, you guys are divided and you despise God's church. You despise it. People accepting the salvation that is offered by God through his son, but rejecting the community to which God combines those who are the saved. Despise in the Greek is actually made up from the word that means down and the word that means to be to think or to express your mind. So it has to do with a mind that thinks down about the church, thinking less of the church, despising the church, holding a controlling negative opinion. You know, all of us get negative. You know, something happens, we, we, we go negative. But holding a controlling negative opinion or attitude against others in the collective group of God is despising the kingdom of God. Despising God's kingdom. How church can be despised. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25 obviously states that some had developed the habit of, of, of forsaking, just not coming. That's despising the church. That's despising the church. Accepting benefit without accepting responsibilities. What can the church do for me? What can it give me without the idea that I need to be giving something? We are not just consumers. 
We are not Christian consumers. We come and see what the church is going to give me. We are participants. We are participants. What can I do? What can I do? By the way, that's why, that's why complaining is spoken of so powerfully in Scripture. Because complaining takes no doing. And I'm supposed to be someone who is doing for the kingdom. Not just taking from the kingdom. Forsaking the truth which the church is the pillar of, according to what Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. Vesting very little, surrendering only the things that are invaluable, and minimalizing the use of our talents and gifts. That's how we can despise the church. You know, have you heard the word uh, mediocrity? Or mediocre? You know, the, the, the etymology of that word is it, it comes it, it, from, to English, it comes from, fr from French. And the word in France means halfway up the mountain. So what are we for a me mediocre Christian? We're halfway up the mountain. I don't want to be halfway up the mountain. I want to be climbing that thing. I want to be accelerating. We can despise the church by putting very little into it. Allowing other things to take the priority position that the kingdom is supposed to have. Remember Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said we're to seek first what? The kingdom of God, seek it first, number one. And if we don't make it number one, we can be despising it. To be divisive, Jesus will teach that a house that is divided against itself can't stand. Of course, Corinthians has already talked about that. Okay, there is this harm that the supper can work, but there is tremendous help. Tremendous spiritual help that we, we glean from the Lord's Supper. We go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So how does the Lord's Supper help? Number one, it helps when we realize what's been delivered about it. What's been delivered about the supper, and we follow that. Jesus actually taught, the bread equals my body. When we eat this bread, we're remembering Jesus' body, his physical existence. He was flesh. He was as common as bread. Jesus was as common as bread. The cup represents the blood that he shed. Merc uh, mercifully, people harmed his flesh to the point of the shedding of his blood. Every time is for the purpose of remembrance. Um, remember the word despise Paul has used to think down on God's kingdom, God's church. But then when he talks about this, he says we are to do this in remembrance. And it's a compound that means to think up, but to do so with a prolonged memory. You know, the reason we, we focus on the Lord's Supper isn't just so we have a time in our service to think about the Lord's Supper. We think up with a prolonged, a prolonged memory. In other words, this is to, this would help carry us through the week. This isn't just for today. This isn't just a powerful part of our assembly. This is a powerful part of our Christian lives. And so we do this today with a prolonged memory that extends beyond our gathering. And it also proclaims the power of Jesus' death until he comes back. We also are, are remembering that what we've been taught is he's coming back. And secondly, the Lord's Supper can help because it becomes a tremendous time to be self-disciplined. To experience discipline that aids us in growing. We're right back to the purpose of community is growth. The Lord's Supper provides me a specific time to discipline myself. Therefore, whoever eats and drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in, in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, 
Many among you are weak, and sick, and a number sleep. Not doing the right thing, no growth. Falling asleep, weak. If we judged ourselves right, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. One not disciplining themselves to greater compliance to Christ is liable and belittling the sacrifice of Christ. That's what Paul says. This is the reason that we do this, to judge ourselves. Self-judgment is to be the atmosphere of the Lord's Supper. You know, we tend to think about, oh, at the Lord's Supper, we remember the sacrifice, the death of Jesus, the burial of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, and we've got, you know, we've got sorrow, and then we've got joy of the resurrection. But one of the primary things that's supposed to happen in the Lord's Supper is a period of self-examination. And that needs to be the atmosphere that we eat this meal in, an atmosphere of self-examination. Refuse that is being spirit, to be spiritually sick, spiritually asleep. The growth that results from self-judgment keeps us away from God's judgment. In other words, as I examine myself and recognize things about me, I come back to I'm trying to grow, I'm trying to achieve. And so God won't judge me for those things. The self-assessment is the way in which the Lord disciplines, which means instruct more than it means punish. In other words, God's, God's here uh, using this tool to instruct me in the way that I need to be. And it makes, uh, it makes us different from the condemned world to take the Lord's Supper. Okay? This is it. Well, the bitter pain and sorrow that a time could ever be when I proudly said to Jesus, all of self and none of thee. All of self and none of thee, all of self and none of thee, when I proudly said to Jesus, all of self and none of thee. Yet he found me, I beheld him, bleeding on the accursed tree, and my wistful heart said faintly, some of self and some of thee. Some of self and some of thee, some of self and some of thee. And my wistful heart said faintly, some of self and some of thee. Day by day, his tender mercy, healing, helping, full and free, brought me lower while I whispered, less of self and more of thee. Less of self and more of thee, less of self and more of thee, brought me lower while I whispered, less of self and more of thee. Higher than the highest heavens, deeper than the deepest sea, Lord, thy love at last has conquered none of self and all of thee. None of self and all of thee, none of self and all of thee, Lord, thy love at last has conquered none of self and all of thee. Everyone have a, a packet of emblems. Father, we are so grateful that Jesus did not count his spiritual abode with you as something he had to hang on to. That he emptied himself and became human, he became flesh, and that in that body he experienced all the trials that we experience. He knew all the temptations that we are faced with. He was a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. He knew all of the pains of life. He knew desertion of friends. He knew help of friends. He knew persecution. He knew hatred. And Father, he still came. And we appreciate his fleshly existence. We appreciate that he became as common as we. We thank you for this bread that reminds us of that part of his existence. And it also, Father, reminds us that he is there for us during our fleshly times. In Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Father, under your old covenant, you proclaim boldly that life was in the blood. It is that which pumps through the body, brings uh, vitality to every part of it. Every organ contributes and takes from it. 
And Father, in the same way, the blood of Jesus is that which pumps through this church body. It makes us one. It makes us recognize that there are nobler parts and less noble parts, but that you count us all as equal, that your blood brings forgiveness and salvation into each of our lives. That we gather here collectively filled with faults, yet none of us have any right to judge another. We are to be judging ourselves. And so as we remember this blood today, let us remember individually how much we depend upon it, how much we rely upon the salvation that's found in the blood of Christ, how much we attempt to vitalize that blood as it flows and works within our community. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.